works. Um, a man, he asked his teenage son to explain where the boy was going with a pick and a shovel and a guitar. That's kind of weird, but a pick, a shovel, and a guitar. And the lad replied back to his father. He said, I'm going to see my girl. I promised to serenade her tonight. That kind of reminds me of Dell with his trumpet, probably somewhere outside of, uh, of Nell's window playing that trumpet out there. But the boy said he was going to, to serenade his girl tonight with a shovel and a pick and his guitar. The dad responded, he said, if that's the case, then why are you taking a pick and a shovel with you? I think, Dad, we would all have replied something of that sort. And the boy said, because she wants me to serenade her under her window. The boy then followed up with, and she lives in a basement apartment. Now, I hope you get that. A basement apartment, uh, that window is underground. <laughs> the teenager was determined he was going to dig that hole and sing to his girl under her basement window. Um, friend, no matter the obstacle that you face, just like this boy, it appears that he was prepared even to use a pick to break through each and every obstacle, each and every rock that got in his way. And we have a lot of different things going on in our lives right now, a lot of things going on in our world right now, obstacles to having a thriving relationship with the Lord, because plain, plainly, we kind of get distracted. It's so easy to get sidetracked and, and to focus on the bad things, the obstacles. But listen, if, if you're a born-again believer, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has given you a spirit of, and I'm leaving out the first part because the application for you today is in the second part of 2 Timothy 1.7. God has given you a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and he's given you a sound mind. You can persevere through the difficulties that you're facing. You can be encouraging to others. You can, while, uh, of course, observing a little social distancing, you can still thrive in your faith. So let's look together in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And we'll start reading in verse 24, Mark chapter 5, verse 24, and we'll read through verse 28. And this is speaking of Jesus. It says, and he, Jesus, went with him, and a crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under the physicians, and had spent all she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. You know, wherever Jesus went, the crowds came. Word spread fast and didn't take long for a few people to become a vast multitude. I mean, that's where the feeding of the 5,000 came from. Started out as just a few and then more and more and more gathered until you had this huge multitude. Jesus, he had been on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and when he returned to this side, very quickly the people assembled to meet him. And this seaside crowd was not only large, but they were very enthusiastic. You and me would say they were a bit chaotic. Verse 24 says that they thronged him. That means that they pressed him really hard, like grapes are pressed when making wine. And that's the way this crowd felt to Jesus. That's the way they would have felt on his body, crushing. It implies a suffocating pressure from that great throng of people. The great multitude was 
pressing Jesus from all sides. And that makes me feel a little claustrophobic just thinking about the way he must have felt just seeing this sea of people all around him, pressing in on him. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the Lord Jesus wasn't claustrophobic, but, um, but my goodness, I would have been. I can only imagine people were pushing from the front to gain position and reach out and touch him just to touch him. Hands stretched out towards him, constantly touching and grabbing and pulling as the Lord tried to navigate through this multitude. And any progress that he made, this sea of people would just continue to follow along with him every step that he was making. And this crowd, as you can imagine, there were all sorts of people. Certainly there were some who were only curious, others who had sin sincere needs. And then there were those that were just in utter and complete desperation. But you know how frenzies happen. The more people go and buy toilet paper, the more toilet paper tends to disappear. It's just human nature. And so as this crowd became more and more energized over the fact that Jesus was there and people wanting to touch him and people wanting to, to grab at him and people wanting to pull him, the more the crowd began to get aggressive, the more that aggression naturally multiplied. So there were those there who were in desperation and they didn't help matters. They, they came to Jesus seeking help. But it didn't help the press of the crowd. It just became more people. Now, one of the people in this great multitude was a woman who had an issue of blood. Now, let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer this, but who was she? How long had she dealt with this problem and who had tried to help her? Those are some things we're going to talk about very quickly. The woman was likely a Jewish woman from Caesarea Philippi. Now this, this town, Caesarea Philippi, was about 27 miles away from where this seaside crowd had gathered, about a one or two day walk. Now remember, in the Bible, a day's journey was considered 20 to 25 miles. That was a reasonable distance that someone could walk, 20 to 25 miles. However, a woman that was in this condition might have been unable to walk with the kind of endurance to get 20 to 25 miles in in a day. So this trip very well could have taken her days, four days, five days, maybe even a week, just depending on how much strength she had. She had to be very determined to make that kind of effort. And she was determined because she showed up. She had been dealing with this problem for, for 12 years. And over 12 years, the problem had progressively not gotten better, but it had gotten worse. She had a flow of blood, and that flow of blood was continuous. There was no break. There was no time in the month when she got relief. It was constant. It was this terrible, chronic hemorrhaging, just unimaginable. What pain this poor, poor woman must have been in as she constantly dealt with this flow of blood. You know, this type of long-term bleeding would almost certainly lead to other health issues like iron deficiency anemia that occurs because of the lack of mineral iron in the body bone marrow in the center of the bone needs iron to make its hemoglobin and part of the red uh, part of that is the red blood cell and they transport oxygen to the body's organs so without iron the body can't produce hemoglobin or not enough hemoglobin for the red blood cells and the resulting condition is that iron deficiency anemia and ultimately anemia slows the body's delivery of oxygen to the body's organs and that would have made her feel very very weak she would have been tired she would have felt like she was going to faint frequently she probably did faint frequently her hair would have been falling out She'd have been either very thin with her hair or no hair at all. She'd have been lightheaded. No doubt she'd have felt very depressed by this situation. 
And then on top of all that, her heart would have been palpitating as it worked overtime to deliver that oxygen to her deprived body. It would have been daily suffering. Remember, no medicine for this kind of thing. The pain from the uncontrolled flow of blood to her body and the uncontrolled flow of blood out of her body, the pain would have been terrible. And the consequences would have been terrible. And if all this physical suffering, all this physical suffering wasn't enough, she also would have suffered socially. No one would have wanted to touch her. No one would have wanted to even pat her on the head and say it's going to be okay. Nobody would have wanted to rub her back for her and said, I'm so sorry you're feeling this way. No one would want to touch her. And the reason why, if you'll, if you'll keep your finger here, Mark, because we're going to come back, and if you'll turn over with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus, here in Leviticus, and I'll go there with you, Leviticus, Leviticus, it explains in detail the social predicament that she was in. So Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, if you start at the beginning of your Bible, Leviticus is the third book. We're going to be Leviticus 15, Leviticus 15. And as a side note, let me remind you as you're turning to Leviticus 15, Jesus knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. I mean, after all, he's the author, right? I mean, he didn't physically write it, but he inspired those who did. Jesus knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards, and everyone in that crowd, everyone in the woman's hometown, every Jew at that time would have understood and knew about what we're about to read. So what we're going to read here, this is very common knowledge in that day and time. Leviticus 15, 25. And I want to read verse 25 uh, through 27. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. Verse 27, and whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and listen, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. So even if she sat down in a chair, and somebody came over and touched the chair, that person was unclean until evening, and they would need to wash themselves because of the uncleanness. Now, this constant flow of blood would have made her, because it's constant, she would have been unclean for 12 years. That would have made her a complete and utter social outcast. No going to the synagogue. No going to any of the celebrations. No going to a friend's house. Nothing. Zero. Unclean. Isolated. Does that sound familiar to some of you? this kind of isolation you and me don't understand. She would have been unclean for 12 years. It would have made her a complete and utter social outcast, rejected by everyone, everyone. No one would have dared to touch her. But listen, it gets worse for her because if you go back to Mark, flip back to the, to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5, and look at verse 26. Mark 5, verse 26, it says, and who, speaking of her, had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all she had and was no better, but grew 
worse. She grew worse. Look, she had spent everything she had. She spent money trying to get well, but not just a little money. How much of her money did she spend trying to get well? How much of it? That's right. She spent all of her money. She spent everything on many physicians trying to get well. She spent all she had on doctors and even the doctors couldn't help her. As a matter of fact, according to verse 26, she suffered many things from the physicians. What that means is that the physicians actually made it worse. They made it worse. She suffered many things. Her pain was intensified because she paid these physicians to try to make her well. These aren't like doctors like we have today. This is primitive medicine. And at times it would have been better for a person to have just stayed home and not to gone to the doctor. But in her case, she was desperate. She tried many doctors, one after the next, after the next. She went to the miracle men. She tried the primitive surgeries. The scripture says she suffered at the hands of the doctors they made it worse. They intensified it. You know what happens when somebody spends all their money? They spend every dime they've got and there's nothing left. I've done that before. Well, probably not like this woman done that before. But when someone spends everything they have and there's nothing left, what are they? What are they? When somebody spends every dime they've got and there's nothing left, what are they? Yeah, they're broke, they're bankrupt, they're destitute, they're impoverished. Simply put, they're a beggar. And this woman was a beggar. Think about it. She wasn't even a qualified prostitute because no one would have had her body because legally, based on that same chapter in Leviticus, they would have been socially unclean for seven days after a sexual encounter with her. So she was no good as a prostitute. She would have never been accepted as a servant because everything she touched, if she picked something up and dusted off a table, guess what? The table's unclean and the thing that she picked up was unclean. She would never have been accepted as a servant because everything she touched would be unclean. She had nowhere to go. She had nowhere to go. She had no one to turn to. She had no further resources. She had spent it all. Simply put, this woman was at the end of her rope, but then she heard about Jesus in verse 27, and she believed, and, and she believed that he was the answer to her problem. He was the answer she had been seeking. Listen to what it says. Having heard the report about Jesus, she was 27 miles away in Caesarea Philippi. She hears the report about Jesus. It's no wonder she traveled 27 miles. She heard reports about Jesus, and you know what that did for her? It gave her hope. There was hope. She was determined that she was going to have an encounter with Jesus. She was determined to persevere through whatever the adversity might the, the, whatever adversity might come between her and her experience with Jesus. She was determined. She heard the reports and she was driven by, get this, you think she was driven just by, uh, say, I want to be healed? She heard the reports about Jesus. She was driven by faith in Jesus that he could do something for her. You see, the target of her faith was not in the healing. The target of her faith was in the source of the healing. Her target of her faith was in Jesus Christ. She was driven by faith in Jesus. In verse 20, 28, it says that she said, she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Friend, you, you think your witness doesn't matter? You think casual talking about the goodness and the grace of Jesus doesn't make a difference? Look, all that she heard were reports about Jesus. People were just talking about him and what he did. There's nothing too terribly confrontational about that. They were just talking about him and what he had done. 
And that was enough to turn her heart toward the Lord Jesus. And for her to say, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. When the scripture says, quote, she said there in verse 28, that verb is imperfect. And what that means is that it was repetitive. She said again and again. It means over and over and over she had been repeating for 27 miles, 27 miles, repeating over and over and over again, probably to herself, because who would have traveled with her? And I can almost imagine her saying it out loud as, as some kind of motivation, some kind of strength as she's traveling and feeling lightheaded and in pain. And she's saying over and over and over again to herself, almost like she's trying to convince herself, if only, if only I may touch his clothes, if only I may touch his clothes, I'll be made well. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Luke tells us the specific article that she was talking about on his garment. Mark says the garment or the hem. But Luke tells us something very specific. Luke chapter 8 verse 44 says that she actually touched the fringe of his garment. Now let's talk for just a minute about the hem of the garment because this is going to help you to understand the significance of what she reached out and touched. In ancient times, the garment was also often woven to show a person's identity. Very unique, especially the hem of the garment. It, it showed a person's identity. It could show a person's status. It could show a person's authority. And you and me today, we think, well, that's kind of weird, the hem of the garment. But at that time, very, very common. Often legal contracts were written in clay. And rather than a person signing their name by hand, they would take that very unique hem of the garment, the very unique hem of the garment, and they would take it and press it into the clay. And that impression that was left behind, get this, it identified the person. Ancient royals would, would embellish that hem of their garments with tassels all, often called fringe. They would use sometimes outlandish colors, and that distinguished them as being royalty. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, God gives a directive with regard to tassels that were already being used by royalty in the Middle East, so this isn't unique. But what is unique is that God told them very specifically not only who was supposed to wear the tassels, why they were supposed to wear the tassels, and how they were supposed to wear the tassels. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, God told Moses to tell the people to make tassels, fringe, which look like tassels, like on a graduate when they've got the tassel hanging off of their mortar cap. There's the tassel hanging down. And these tassels were very similar to that, perhaps a little thinner and quite a bit longer. But God told Moses to tell the people to make tassels on the corner of their garment because the ephod, or that shirt that they wore, the robe, it was had four corners on it. It had four, or two corners on the front and two corners on the back. So God told them to place these tassels on the corners of their ephod, the, the, the robe. And to this very day, devout Jews, they'll wear a shirt, oftentimes an undershirt, and they will wear these long tassels on the shirt. Sometimes the tassels are tucked in where you can't see them inside the pant legs, but very frequently the tassels, if you look up pictures of modern day uh, um, Jews, you'll see tassels frequently hanging out, particularly in the back. You'll see these tassels hanging out the back of their jacket or off the end of their shirt. And it's because they are still abiding by God's directive in Numbers chapter 15, where God said, put the tassels on the corner of your shirt. But oftentimes in today's uh, uh, Jewish culture, you rather than seeing it on the shirt, you will see it on prayer shawls. You'll see the tassels on the corners of the 
prayer shawls. And when people go to prayer, they'll take that that prayer shawl and place it over their head or over their shoulders, and the tassels will hang down. And uh, and that is a, a way of them also abiding by this passage in Numbers. God explained to Moses that these tassels were a symbol to remember the commandments of God, to do the commands of God. So you can imagine Jesus as he's walking along out there, he too abided by the word of God, his own word. In Numbers chapter 15, where the directive to the Jews was, wear the tassels. So the tassels were to remember the commandments of God. It was also a reminder to them, not only of the commandments of God, but to do the commandments of God and to remember the holiness of God. The tassels to this day are actually called, get this, they're called zit zit. That's the tassel. So um, next time you see a graduate, uh, graduating from high school or from college or kindergarten, and you see them with their little tassel there, you can say zit zit. I'm just kidding. Um, zit zit. They were and are still a very sacred symbol to the Jewish people. Now these tassels, each tassel had one blue thread. Now the tassels you see today a lot of times are knotted. During Jesus's time, the tassels were not knotted. They hang. They hung freely. The knots came in sometime during the first century. Um, so Jesus's tassels undoubtedly did not have the knots in them. They did hang freely. Um, each tassel had one blue thread and the blue dye that they used. It was very, very rare dye. Um, it was actually made from a sea creature, a type of snail. And, um, and it was the color of, of we're told the noonday sky, a very light blue color. Um, you will see that color on the Israeli flag. You'll see that blue. Um, some say that the snail was not used or that later it was changed and they started using the what's called the asp of Jerusalem. It was a it was a type of um, of, uh, of, uh, of dye that they got from uh, from the uh, from the asp of Jerusalem. And uh, anyway, the Ark of the Covenant, whenever it was transported anywhere, they actually took a blue cloth, the same color blue, and they would throw it over the Ark of the Covenant. So, uh, and then also the priests, the priests would wear um, this a, a, an ephod that was entirely blue. The whole thing was this color blue. So um, the blue thread also was made of wool while all the other threads were actually made of linen. Now I'm gonna to get to the point of all this, so we're kind of you know, plowing some deep soil here, but stay with me. Um, the blue thread was made of, of wool just as the priestly ephod was made of wool. While the other threads in the zit zit or the uh, fringe was made of linen and it was a whitish color. And uh, the uh, the person wearing this, the idea behind that single blue thread was that the priestly robe, because it had blue and the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant was covered with a blue cloth, uh, the, the tassel was a reminder to Israel that they were God's chosen people. And that thread was just a single thread that reminded them that they were all a part of the broader, greater priesthood. They were all the chosen people. They were here to serve God. They were here to represent him to the world. And the hem or the tassel or the fringe, these were very sacred marks, sacred symbols. And that explains to us one thing, just as a side note, why in 1 Samuel 24 verse 5, you remember uh, Saul when he went in to relieve himself in the cave and King Saul and David snuck in, or well, David snuck in kind of behind Saul and he cut off the hem of Saul's garment, possibly the tassel of Saul's garment. And you can read that on your own in 1 Samuel 25. But that explains why David felt so bad, so deeply uh, uh, terrible about what he had done. And although there was more to it than just the fact that he cut off the tassel, including the representation of what that meant, um, you can read that on your own, but that does explain to us why he felt so bad that he cut the hem off of Saul's garment. Now, this woman in Mark, she had faith. 
if she could just touch one of those flowing tassels that dangled at the corner of Je corners of Jesus' garment, she had a determined belief that if she could just touch even that, just one of those little tassels, that she would be made well. Have you ever known that God was leading you to do something and you felt an overwhelming sense that, that you needed to be obedient to pursue? And you had this supernatural sense, the supernatural confidence and excitement that fueled your walk of faith. This woman had that. She had hope and she was convinced that, that hope was found in Jesus. How did she know that Jesus could heal her? How'd she know that? How'd she know that Jesus could heal her? Well, Romans 10, 17 tells us how. Paul tells us. Paul says in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. Now, what happened to her? She heard the reports. That was what initiated this whole thing. Remember, the reports were the story of Jesus. She had heard the gospel. The gospel is unfolding before her. Now, although it wasn't the full gospel that we understand after the resurrection and the glorification of Christ, that but it was as much truth as could be revealed at that time. So she had heard as much of the gospel that had been opened up at that time. There was hope in Jesus. She had heard the reports of him. And with that, with that measure of truth, God burdened her with the overwhelming sense of hope and excitement and opportunity in the person of Jesus Christ. But what was she going to do? She felt burdened to touch him, just the fringe. But what is that? What is it when an unclean person who has a flow of blood touches another person, even if it is just the fringe? She was thinking of doing the unthinkable in this culture. She was burdened to touch Jesus, and according to social laws, she was going to make Jesus unclean in every sense of the Levitical law. Now, of course, she didn't, wouldn't, and couldn't, by touching him, make him unclean. But in her mind, that's where she was at. She knew the repercussions of her touch. She knew that in her mind, from her perspective, that Jesus would be unclean till evening. So what was she going to do? And here's her opportunity. The crowd is pressing. She's feeling weak. She's very tired. 27 miles later, she has every reason to give up and give in, but she perseveres through the difficulty. And those of you who are athletes, you know what that means. You know what it means to hit the wall and think I can't go any further, but then somewhere inside you find it to go just a little bit further. And this is her, she found it just a little bit more to persevere through. And in verse 27, it says she came from behind him in the crowd and from the back of Jesus. Jesus is not looking toward her. From the back of Jesus, she stretches out her hand and she touches him. Now everyone is touching him, but she touches him. He was pressed from all sides. He was thronged, remember? Her hand is one of dozens that were touching him. And in her mind, here's what she's thinking. Here's what she's thinking. He'll never know. He'll never know. I've thought that before about things. Nobody will ever know. Well, guess what? God always knows. God always always knows, and in her mind, she thought she could be unknown, unidentified, anonymous, touch him, and receive the healing that he had to give. But you know what? The Lord doesn't allow for anonymous Christians, does he? Is there any such thing as an anonymous Christian? There is no such thing as an anonymous Christian. If you think you're an anonymous Christian, you fail to identify with Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, and you better rethink your faith. Our faith is a public identification, just as the Jews wore the tassels on the edge of their garment. That was their public identification. You must, and, and even the the kings and the princes from all around thought to themselves, 
Why is it that all of those Jews wear the tassels that only the royals wear? And I'll tell you why. It's because that was their royal garb that God had given them. Church, our faith is a public proclamation and you and I must bear the image of Jesus Christ and publicly identify with him. There is no such thing as anonymous Christianity. Here's this woman. She wants to remain anonymous. Uh, she wants to remain anonymous. And in her mind, she's thinking Jesus will never know. She'd just be one of the many hands that are touching and grabbing and pulling in that multitude. And in her mind, he'd never know he was unclean from her touch because she would touch him from the back and be just one of many. And in verse 29, look there in your Bible, verse 29, look at what happens. It says, and immediately, which this actually touches him, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she had been healed of the disease. There's two things that happen immediately here. Immediately she's healed. The flow of blood is dry. The disease is cured. It's completely gone. The word here for disease, it means a whip or a scourge. It's a feeling of distress caused by this disease. It had been painful, like a whip or a scourge, but now her pain was gone and her guilt is gone. And look at verse 30, and Jesus perceived, remember you can't hide anything from God. You can't be anonymous with God. He sees all, he knows all. Verse 30, and Jesus perceived in himself that power, remember God had given him the Holy Spirit, God had endowed him on this earth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Verse 30, and Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him. And immediately, what does Jesus do? Immediately, Mark tells us, which he uses the word immediately a lot. But immediately, Jesus turned about in the crowd, searching with his eyes, and he says, who touched my garments? And you know what? Everybody in the whole crowd should have raised their hands up and said, it was me. It was us. It was all 20 of us. We all touched you. What a question for the disciples to hear, because think about it. Jesus' disciples are right here with him amid the chaos. The hands are all over him. The noise of the people, the shouting, the talking, the incitement, the pressing throng. And Jesus asks, with all those hands on him, who touched me? And what did the disciples say? Verse 31, the disciples said, you see the crowd pressing around you? They're all around pressing and touching, and yet you say, who touched me? The disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant. They saw that there were people all around touching him. So why was he being asked, who why was he asking who touched me? How can anyone know that? I mean, there's so many, Lord, that are touching you. But Jesus continued to search the crowd with his eyes until his eyes fell on her. Verse 32. Look at verse 32. And he looked around. This is his eyes. He's looking around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and in trembling, and she fell down before him, and she told him the whole truth. She told him the whole truth. Well, I tell you, there's something nice about coming clean when you know you've been dishonest. I don't know about you, but I've been there. It feels good to get it off your chest. This woman is shaking with reverence as she fell at the feet of Jesus. And she then admitted it was her. She had touched him. She told him the whole truth. She told him everything. She told him, I've got an issue of blood. I'm unclean. She had been miserable. She had been desperate. She told him all those things, but she also told him she was confident in her faith. She knew if she could only touch his clothes, she'd be made well. She told him everything, including when I heard the reports about you, I had to get here because I knew you could do something. She was confident in her faith. She knew if she could just touch the fringe, she'd be made well. I don't know about 
you, how many of you have felt a burden and you just felt that you had to get something off your chest, you just had to tell someone, and when you finally did start talking about it, you couldn't stop, you just spilled out everything, you just came completely clean with all the details. What a relief in Mark 34, after she finished. What relief, the guilt is gone, I feel so much better. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. What was the subject of her faith? What was the subject of her faith? Was it his clothes? Was it the fringe or the tassel or the hem? No, the subject of her faith were the reports, the reports of what? The reports of him, Jesus Christ, her faith in him saved her. It was her faith that saved her physically. It was her faith that saved her spiritually. Look back at 34, Jesus tells her to go in peace, go in shalom. Jesus had closed one season of her life, a very tra tragic season of her life. And he had opened up a new season, a new season in her life, a fresh chapter in her life where she would be at peace with God and herself. Shalom, at peace with God, at peace with herself. That's what Jesus was saying. He was saying, Shalom, be at peace with me and be at peace with yourself. Do you need a fresh start, friend? Are you ready for a new season, a new chapter? Are you anticipating all the wonderful things that God has in store for you? Because he does. Jeremiah 29, I mean, there's difficulties, man. There's always obstacles. There's always tough times. That's what perseverance is, is pushing through them. It's getting through those things. Like the marathon runner, when he hits the wall and he keeps going and suddenly he has a second wind. Persevere through them because God has wonderful things in store for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I, this is speaking of God, God says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. Get this, to give you a future and a hope. Church, we got a future and we've got a hope. You know why? Because even if we die, we have a future and a hope for all of eternity through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's not just a future and a hope in eternity. It is a future and a hope now. We are not left without hope because he sent us the Comforter who endowed us too with power to persevere. Don't give up, keep going. You can do it. Be determined to persevere through your adversity and keep your faith in Jesus Christ because you know what? He will never fail you. Let's pray. Father, help us to be determined. Father, help us to persevere through difficulty. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us hope for now, hope for eternity. Father, may we experience shalom in our life. Peace with you and peace with ourself. Not peace in our sin, but peace as you deliver us from it. Father, forgive us for our failures and our faults, our sins of omission, our sins of commission. And thank you, Lord, that through your word you enlighten us, you illuminate you reveal. Father, may we be faithful as we talked about last week to walk in what light you have given us. For we know that as we walk, you will reveal more of yourself. Oh Lord, we want to know you more. Deep within our heart, we want to know you. Reveal yourself to us, Father. And we will be faithful to walk in your word and in your way. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that when this woman reached out, she touched the symbol of hope, which was the tassel, the symbol of God's holiness being with the people, the symbol of the commandments, the symbol of living in those commandments. But in touching the symbol, she actually touched who the symbol represented. She touched the Savior. Lord, may we reach out and touch you today in Jesus' name. All right, church. Well, it's been so good to meet with you today. I pray that you would have a blessed week this week. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. And uh, remember, from our family to yours, we love you. But more importantly, Jesus loves you. Have a blessed day.